happy to be back in uh, Ensenada again. At uh, I better mention this is uh, going to be a informal uh, seminar. So uh, anytime you have any questions, you want to uh, ask anything, just uh, feel free to do so. And I'm not going to have a comprehensive coverage <laughs> of planetary nebulae. I'll go back a little bit of history, and then I uh, will focus on uh, uh, so maybe a single topic that I understand this topic is of interest of the uh, researchers here. And then uh, some other topics, for example, chemistry, I'm not going to talk about because that's going to be the subject of uh, tomorrow's uh, uh, colloquium. Okay. So I will say a little bit about history. Now, why do we uh, want to talk about history? Now, first of all, planetary nebulae is a very long, uh, uh, very old subject going back more than 200 years. And I think uh, there are a lot of lessons that uh, we can learn from going through the history because they, we have gone through many detours and uh, uh, misunderstandings uh, in these uh, last 200 years, and I think by we can learn from uh, those mistakes, and in particular to me it's uh, very useful that today when we look at our present understanding that we may be a little bit more uh, alert to whether we are uh, in a similar situation of being uh, mistaken, and also uh, not to reinvent the wheels. I mean, you know, some of the concepts in science which have been extremely popular uh, in their days, we don't hear about them anymore. So, so science is a thing in progress, and whatever we are, whatever is in fashion or to be believed to be true, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, valid uh, in the future. So going back over 200 years, we have uh, the Messier catalog, where the first uh, four planetary nebulae were catalogued as extended objects. And uh, after the invention of spectroscopy, the first object that were detected to have uh, discrete <coughs> lines is a planetary nebula. So it was demonstrated when you have a nebulous object. It is not a collection of stars, but it is truly a, a gaseous uh, object. In 1922, Erwin uh, Hubble, uh, he uh, found a correlation between the size of the nebula and the brightness of central star, and he proposed that the energy of, of the radiation of the nebula, in fact, was derived from the star, uh, which, of course, that's what we believe now. That specifically, uh, how this energy is transferred was done by Donald Manson. Uh, he suggested he... Uh, energy transfer is uh, taking place by Lyman continuum. So the stars are hot, significant amount of flux are above the uh, uh, Lyman limit, and those uh, photons uh, photoionize the uh, atomic gas, and the uh, uh, allowing the uh, uh, emission lines to be emitted in the nebula. So by assuming this process, then one can look at a certain hydrogen line, say H beta, and one can infer the temperature of the central star. And those stars are much hotter uh, than normal main sequence stars. And uh, one of the uh, 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 puzzles in the early 20th century is, uh, is the number of unidentified lines, and those were uh, suggested to be some kind of a new element, like beryllium, but actually by uh, uh, Bowen was able to demonstrate that those are actually uh, uh, due to metastable states of oxygen, and nitrogen and so on, and they are uh, actually uh, normal elements, but uh, emitting lines that we don't see in the ter terrestrial laboratory. Now, uh, also the number of objects have been increasing, and uh, they had uh, been catalogued either by looking for uh, extended uh, objects uh, in uh, photographic plates, or through objective prism survey. So objective prism survey allow you to cover a large part of the sky, and then uh, identify those which have emission lines. And uh, the, uh, the, the whole details of the physical processes of how the uh, central star photoionized the nebula, uh, exciting the uh, atoms in the nebula, either by recombination or by collision or excitation, allow then one to derive the chemical abundance of the different elements in the nebula, and that laid the foundation of uh, nuclear synthesis or test of nuclear synthesis. 
Now then next came the question of uh, stellar evolution. Now at which part of the uh, life of a star would planetary nebula fit in? And it wasn't an easy question because in the early 20th century, the idea was that stars evolved down the main sequence. So when you have a hot star, then it was assumed that it is a young star. So planetary nebulae was assumed to be young population, but that is not consistent with the galactic distribution because from galactic distribution, it belonged to the old population. So, so Curtis was suggesting these are not young stars, but uh, actually evolved stars. And then I think that this is uh, really a milestone by Swarovski in 1956. He was the first to propose that planetary nebulae are descendants of red giants and uh, progenitors of white dwarfs. So now, and in 1966, a Bell and Goldright uh, looked at the expansive velocity of planetary nebulae, and they concluded they are similar to the uh, escape velocity expected of red giants, and therefore they proposed that uh, planetary the nebula that were ejected from the atmosphere of uh, red giant stars. So one have to place them on the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, as the is typically done for their evolution. So we need a number of things. We need the luminosity of the central star as well as the temperature. Now, for the luminosity, uh, we can try to determine the flux, which, for example, can come from the magnitude of the central <coughs> star. For the temperature, we already have a method using the uh, hydrogen line in the nebula as the dialogic tool. Two, uh, so that's so called a central method. And then for distance, uh, the uh, only way available was a statistical method called the Swarovski method, which assumed that all the nebula are point two solar masses and the nebula were ionization bound and so on. So you, you put all this information uh, into, uh, onto the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. So in the 1960s, Odell. Harman and Seelen, they created uh, uh, this diagram. So this is uh, the main sequence. The uh, central stars of planetary nebulae will uh, belong to the, this band. And this is the horizontal branch, and there is the red giant branch. So that was so-called Harman Seelen sequence. Yes. Yeah. Not yet, not yet, not yet known yet. Yeah, so, so at that time we only knew about red giants and they are uh, looking at global clusters, uh, they were believed to evolve to the horizontal branch. So these were summarized by uh, uh, Don Osterbach in the 1973 proceedings of uh, uh, planetary nebulae. So what is the idea? They said uh, the Hermann-Sillen sequence represents the path of evolution of planetary nebulae central stars. They were formed at the end of the horizontal branch, followed by rapid rise in temperature and luminosity. And it was, uh, paper in Nature by Ian Roxwell. Okay? Now, and in the same issue, uh, the Nature editor wrote an editorial <laughs> <laughs> saying that the theoretical models oh, yeah. agree with observational data, everything is solved, <laughs> we have a complete understanding of the predatory level of phenomena. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, this cannot be more wrong, okay? <laughs> as we now know. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, now, then there, there are a large number of people trying to reproduce the evolutionary track because that is supposed to be due to nuclear burning. So you have to have a nuclear burning model which can reproduce this uh, horseshoe shape of the Hermann Hirschen sequence. But that is very difficult to do because we are limited by the dynamical time. You know, the age of planetary nebula is only 20,000, 20,000 years. And uh, during each part of the evolution, we are talking about a few thousand years. So you require a star to go through a huge change in the velocity and temperature within, say, a thousand year time scale is extremely difficult. So many people have tried and they all failed. Okay. Now, in hindsight, what was the problem? The problem was in the observations because the, uh, the, the, the central stars were just not plotted correctly. There are a number of problems. For example, the nebulae may not be ionization bounded, so we are missing UV photons. And later, from infrared astronomy, we learned that along the flux are being emitted by dust components in the infrared, 
So we are missing the infrared flux. Since the stars are hot, uh, more than 30,000 degrees, so the amount of light coming out in the visible is not a dominant amount. And they are also contaminated by nebular emission. And of course, the Slavsky method are totally, totally wrong. So I mean, so, so everything together, we have a very uh, a wrongly determined plot of uh, luminosity and temperature. And, uh, and that, that's why the, uh, the, the tracks cannot be reproduced by uh, any nuclear burning model. Okay, now <laughs> how was it solved? It was solved by a total stranger to the field, uh, Kuczynski. Now Kuczynski did not work on planetary nebulae, he was there at Evolution Portal. He built, uh, he, in his time, very simple model of stellar structure based on whatever computers were available at, to, at that date, those days. So he was the one who uh, looked at the so-called asymptotic giant branch phenomenon, which is double shell burning. So it, above the hydrogen, uh, oxygen, electron degenerate coal, you have first the uh, uh, hydrogen burning and then helium burning. And, uh, and his model was extremely simple because he knows from the structure of white dwarf what is the structure of the electron degenerate carbon oxygen coal. So you just put a little bit of hydrogen on top of the coal and keep adding it. Okay, so, and then he built models, which are time depend independent models, static models, I mean, one after another, and say, well, we are looking at the reverse, we are taking the hydrogen layer away a little bit, a little bit, and that has this evolutionary track. Okay, so he allowed the star to evolve by reducing the mass in his static model, by changing the mass in the hydrogen envelope, and he found that the star will not evolve, that means won't go to the the blue side until the temperature that the envelope mass is less than 10 to the minus 3 solar masses. Okay? So when it does move, then it moves very quickly. And the, uh, the, the, it was so quick that uh, the mass of the core is basically unchanged because there is not enough time to accumulate uh, mm -hmm. additional mass due to, due to nuclear burning. Mm -hmm. So the star basically evolved at constant luminosity. That's very different from the Hertzman Russell type. Uh, from the, uh, the Hermann Seeden sequence. Okay? So he presented uh, uh, his uh, theories. Uh, this basically is hydrogen shell burning on an electron degenerate carbon oxygen core, uh, published in 1971. And uh, the, the, the evolution is due to the thinning of hydrogen envelope due to hydrogen burning. And now we know also by mass loss. So the central star evolved constantly in the velocity, but it is very sensitive. Uh, to the mass of the core, I mean the high mass core would burn very quickly and uh, uh, because he, he did several models and uh, he presented those in the 1976 IAU Symposium on Planetary Nebula in, uh, in uh, Ithaca, New York and, uh, and most people didn't believe it. I mean first of all he was an outsider and uh, secondly he uh, was uh, creating all these uh, threats horizontal models which are contrary to what everyone believes and also the time scales were very short. So, so, so that, uh, but he was the one who totally changed our understanding of uh, stellar evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and those models were either extended by Schumbrenner, even uh, with them, so on. Okay. That was, that was, that was the near IAU symposium here, was it? Yes, yes, in 1976. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I was there. It was my, uh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, most of the stuff were very classical. I mean, uh, you, you look at the proceedings. There are only a couple of new things, and uh, one is uh, Pechinsky paper, mm -hmm. and the other were a couple infrared papers. Okay. Yeah. So this is the <laughs> current track uh, with this uh, three solar mass track done by uh, Thomas Blocker. So you see the tracks are now horizontal until the, um, uh, the hydrogen sh uh, shell are completely uh, depleted by, uh, by hydrogen burning, then the energy is provided by the, uh, the contraction of the, uh, of the core, and then the uh, luminosity decreases onto the white drop branch. Now that, uh, uh, because the planetary nebula has two components. One is the central star, which we discussed, and another is nebula, and nebula is expanding. So we have a good idea about the, uh, the, the age of the nebula because we can measure the expansion velocity. 
So now if you have a planetary nebula at existence to require both components, you have to have a gaseous nebula and you have to have a central star which is bright, hot enough and uh, luminous enough to ionize, to ionize it. So the, the time of evolution is uh, 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 dependent on both components. So if you have a high mass uh, central star, then the star would evolve so quickly across the HR diagram, then uh, the lifetime of planetary nebula would be extremely short. Or if the mass is too low, <coughs> then the nebula would have dissipated into the interstellar medium uh, before photoionization, and therefore you never observe a planetary nebula. So this is a time-dependent dynamical phenomenon requiring understanding of both the evolution of central star as well as the nebula. So this is a simulation. Uh, we have an initial mass function, initial final mass relationship. Then we predict uh, no, our about 10,000 stars. And that would be the distribution of the, uh, the, the central star planetary nebula. And you can see that they all concentrated uh, along the, um, the about you know, below 0.6 solar mass. So these are all based on the so-called uh, Schumpeter model, which, uh, yeah. Why is there that hook there? Those yeah, this, uh, this is a bit of a way of cooling. Mm -hmm. It depends on the, the cooling rate and uh, so on, yeah. yeah. And these are actually observed. Okay. So actually, there they have been uh, quite a few amount of work comparing these uh, theoretical simulations to actual distribution of wage drops and so on, yeah. Sorry, maybe I lost your account. Uh, these are the final star masses. Right. But the initial masses of the main sequence, what? Uh, yeah, they, I, I didn't say it here, but we assume the initial mass, final mass relationship. Mm -hmm. So basically, eight solar mass bec would become 1.4 solar masses. Just above the ten, a second number, and say one solar mass would become 0.6 solar masses. So this is a little bit uncertain because we are now still trying to have a better initial final mass relationship because we don't. These are all based on distribution of white dwarfs and mm -hmm. and so on. But this is an assumption. I mean, assuming that and assuming an initial, uh, I mean, the initial mass function because they are more low mass stars than high mass stars. Yes. Oh, it's just a number. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the sa a sample. And then you divide them into different <coughs> initial mass beans, and then you let them evolve, you know. Yeah. 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 Now, the next part is the nebula. Okay, so we talk about our change in understanding of the central star. We now have to talk about the nebula. Now, how is the nebula ejected? So, so because um, uh, that according to Abel and Goldwright, the uh, nebula is the ejected hydrogen envelope, then you have to find some instability to eject the envelope. So, so there are a number of uh, possibilities, either dynamical instability, pulsational instability, because the uh, AGB stars are pulsating, and uh, the thermal instabilities, radiation pressure, thermal pulses, large, large number of papers in the 60s and <coughs> 70s physical mechanisms of ejecting the nebula. But they also have problems. Because when you have suddenly ejection of a nebula, C.2 solar masses, they, they will naturally fall back onto the star uh, by gravity. So you, you, there is a problem of backfill, and uh, you have to somehow provide additional pressure to uh, maintain the nebula shape so that it's not falling back onto the star. And, and more fundamentally, because Pachinsky uh, in his models show, these are very simple models, that if you have a star with less, with uh, more than 10 to the minus 3 solar masses on a, say, 0.6 solar mass star, then the star would not evolve. Okay? So you could eject, say, from a two, uh, uh, from, say, eject the envelope of say 0.2 solar masses, but if you only eject it a little bit less, then <laughs> there will be enough mass above the core to start with ever you off. So, I mean, no sort of ejection mechanism can be so precise, say, wow, I eject everything except a little bit left, and then, uh, so, so that, that uh, if you don't eject the right amount, then the star will just stay there 
uh, in the red and never uh, evolved to the blue. Now, so that change really at this uh, problem was only uh, able to be solved by the discovery of mass law on the AGB. So in the late 1960s, by introduction of infrared photometry, we were uh, able to discover that uh, many uh, AGB stars have uh, infrared excess, and this infrared excess is interpreted to be due to dust emission, which is the result of a mass ejection through the mechanism of a stellar wind. So they can have a very large amount of uh, mass ejected, this uh, little bit of excess, this uh, silicate feature in emission. Now it can be so much mass ejected that the photosphere, this is one micron, are completely obscured and the entire photosphere output is shifted into the infrared. So this is one of the extreme examples uh, of the star that was discovered by us. So this is supposedly underlying continuum of uh, 2500 degree black body and there is an actually observed spectrum and white mine coin is here so you have a star which all the photospheric output in the optical are shifted into the infrared uh, by dust absorption and re-emission re so this dotted line is the radiation transfer model and the star suffered several hundred magnitudes of extinction uh, in the V-band so that uh, discovery led to make us to think that all this mass ejected on the AGB must have an effect uh, on the formation of planetary nebulae and that's uh, now the so-called interacting stellar wind model where that uh, previously ejected material were re uh, rearranged by a later developed fast wind into a shell morphology and the expansion is driven by a shock, uh, a regular shock of the, uh, uh, the uh, so-called hot bubble expansion is due to thermal thermal pressure. So so the, uh, the, the the fast wind is needed to compress, to shape, and to accelerate the, uh, the slow wind which were ejected from the asymptotic giant branch. <coughs> now we are fortunate uh, to be easy was at a time that uh, just about a number of uh, satellite missions were being launched, in particular the IUE, so right after in uh, Theory was uh, developed that was the IUE satellite who was able to detect the PSAC profiles from central stars of planetary nebulae, showing that they have stellar winds of uh, several thousand kilometers per second. And that shows that the fast winds are actually, actually there. <coughs> and from um, uh, uh, ground based observations with introductions of CCD camera, one can see that there are faint halos outside planetary nebulae representing the remnants of the AGB wind, and also by uh, uh, infrared observations, we can see the dust, uh, the dust envelope of the, the remnant, and so on and so forth. So in of course, the bubble was detected in the <coughs> X-ray by X-ray emission. So, so now, then, then in the, we, we have uh, in the uh, 1980s, then we left with a system that Planetary Nebula is a dynamical system with having two components. The uh, nebula is expanding, uh, coupled to the central star in two ways, both uh, by uh, uh, um, uh, radiation uh, through ionization and also dynamically uh, through the stellar wind. So we have a changing uh, stellar, stellar temperature and the luminosity, and also a changing mass loss rate. And these things together, uh, through uh, photoionizing, and also a dynamical model <coughs> that uh, caused the uh, observed uh, expansion velocity of the planetary nebula uh, with time and so on. So all this can be calculated. So this is so-called coupled evolution, and uh, many papers were uh, done in the uh, uh, 90s and, uh, and even ex uh, expanded into two-dimensional in order to uh, try to explain some of the morphological uh, features of planetary nebulae. So this is a schematic. So the, uh, the set output of the central star, uh, shortwood of the line continuum goes into the gas component, which create the uh, 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 optical spectrum that we see through collisional excited lines or recombination lines. But the longer wavelength photon go into the mutual gas, which molecular and dust component, which give us uh, molecular emission and uh, 
infrared continuum reaction, and then the uh, mechanical output that drives the, uh, uh, the uh, circumstance of the gas and dust into a, uh, <coughs> into a planetary nebula. <coughs> so one dimensionally, uh, one can work this all out, and uh, one can uh, predict the uh, morphological structure of the, uh, of the planetary nebulae, and uh, I will show some examples later, because even in one dimensional, in a spherical symmetric case, you still have uh, uh, multiple kind of structures. And by uh, de using these kind of models, uh, one can reproduce <coughs> some of these uh, morphological structures. <coughs> now, I'll come back a little bit, on, uh, which will be relating to the upcoming next topic, is what is a primary nebula. Now, Coltec uh, has this observational definition. So he has to have the um, uh, very strong oxygen three lines in order to be distinguished from, say, H2 regions. So the central star must have certain kind of property. The nebula have to have some properties and so on. So that seems to be a perfectly uh, good definition, except they are not unique. So there are other things that uh, all have, they have similar kind of Namely, uh, emission on galaxies, refraction nebulae, H2 regions, roof rate nebulae, you know, these symbiotic stars, and, and so on. That gets very confusing. So you have a low excitation that planetary nebula where the, uh, the oxygen three line is almost the same as the uh, H alpha line, and you have a symbiotic star, which has uh, also emission line behavior. Now, except in this case, we know that it is. Uh, symbiotic stars is because we see a Myra in the spectrum having a photosoric water band and also we have uh, a period uh, due to pulsation. So we know that this is uh, a symbiotic star, not a planetary nebula. <coughs> but sometimes uh, the cases are not so, not so easy to distinguish. Now, almost at the same time, at another IEU symposium, Baczynski gave a other equally important paper, <laughs> okay, that was in the Coast of Evolution in 1975. And he was talking about common envelope evolution. Now, that's uh, very important because it ex provided the theoretical basis of a whole range of phenomena of characteristic variables. So, the first example was NOVI. Uh, we know that uh, NOVI, since uh, Robert Kraft work, that NOVI were binary, uh, were product of binary evolution, and then uh, and that uh, the, the, the work of Pachinsky, that uh, followed by uh, many people who have a more open up a systematic understanding of his characteristic <coughs> uh, uh, variables, and uh, what is the classical nova, I mean, the, the white dwarf evolved backwards. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, binary evolution, uh, they are the, the, uh, the the, the, the problem is that there are many, many scenarios and possibilities. The mass transfer can be through the Roshrup, can be through the wind, and uh, the, uh, it can be at different phases of stellar evolution. So the number of uh, branches of uh, a common envelope evolution is uh, huge. So this is just one example uh, of the, the kind of evolutionary tree. I think, uh, I mean, I'm not a expert in these things, some people in the audience may know better, you know, there are many hundreds of uh, branches uh, in the current <coughs> star evolution tree. Okay, so now when you have a binary, uh, 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 a common envelope, then you could have a common envelope ejection. Okay, so that was outlined by Paczynski and Webbing and uh, a number of other people, and uh, depending on when, when this occurred, then you will have a nebula uh, outside of the uh, binaries, a central star. Okay? Now, the key thing is that what happens after the ejection? Will it evolve? Okay? Now, if it doesn't evolve, will, will we call it a planetary nebula? Because our assumption is that planetary nebula is an evolution phenomenon. Okay? <coughs> so there are uh, papers now saying that all planetary nebulae are binary systems. They are basically a common envelope phenomenon. And uh, when I, they, they, my question is that if that were the case, then what kind of CV is it? I mean, which branch? Yes. 
I've heard uh, Ursula saying that uh, facts are in every life. Ah. They need to be binaries, otherwise they wouldn't expel the uh, I don't know why she says that. Uh -huh. I don't understand the argument. Yeah. I mean, you have proven that uh, that you can actually expel the envelope. Right. And something that has not been actually proven yeah. is that is that you can you can actually eject the envelope through right. a closed binary yes. encounter. Right. So when she stands up in, in our meetings and talks about this with lots of confidence, I'm feel a bit at a loss. I don't know what the argument is. Yeah, so so that's one trying to argue. Mm -hmm. That is okay to say that. But you have to produce a self-consistent scenario. And first of all, you have to be precise. You have to say, well, what kind of CV is it? Because there are several hundred kinds of CV, right? You have to say, well, this kind of CV produces a branch tree nebula. You have to identify on this tree which branch is it on, okay? So, so I mean, we evolve. I mean, uh, you know, we were already saying previously that you can have an ejection, <coughs> but if you leave behind more than 10 to the minus 3 solar masses, then it's not evolving. Okay? So how do you control the amount of, le uh, of material left? Now, now CBR stars are observationally very similar to planetary nebulae. And there are many, many confusing examples uh, in planetary nebulae ca catalogs, which later turn out to be CBR stars. But they have very different evolutionary status. Okay? So, and that was again all done by Berchinsky and Wudek in 1980. They outlined what is the mass transfer rate relationship with relating to the hydrogen burning rate would they create a symbiotic star. So that is very specific. So if, they, uh, if the, the, trend, uh, the reactions are balanced, then you have a symbiotic. If you have uh, an imbalanced situation, the white drop will be walk backwards and will become a white a movie. Okay, so David Allen was the one. Unfortunately, he died very early. That uh, outlined the uh, the whole symbiotic star phenomenon, and uh, and that he is uh, now I think uh, thanks to David Allen, is very well understood phenomenon, and we shouldn't confuse it with the PN. Okay, so so the so number one thing is that we have to say when we see an object in the sky, what is it? Okay, if he is definitely a symbiotic star, then we look at it as a symbiotic star. We should call it a planetary nebula, although you see the planetary nebula catalog, <laughs> that, uh, that, that, that you confuse the issue, okay? Now, so what is a planetary nebula? I mean, we don't have a consensus on the definition. So I would like to have a definition based on evolution. So, which is that some kind of ionized circumstellar shell showing some degree of symmetry surrounding a hot compact star evolving from the AGP to white drops. Not static, not backwards, okay? Now, we know such objects must exist because we, are, we can see white drops, okay? <laughs> we can see red giants. <laughs> there must be a way for a red giant to go to a white drop. Now, before you have a CV, you first to have a white drop. So, you have to get to the white drop first before you can have a CV, okay? So before we talk about this, uh, whatever, a second generation ejection phenomenon, first you have to get to the, the white drop, and that, I think, is through the planetary nebula uh, stage. Okay. Oh, now I wanted to talk about which uh, something that's more specific, that maybe I, I understand that of interest to people here, is the morphological classifications. So, now, he was started as early as nine, uh, uh, Curtis, because Curtis already recognized us from the photographs of planetary nebulae. They have all kinds of shapes and morphologies, and uh, so in the, in the catalog, Perrett and Kotek, he has a uh, number of descriptions, and later, Strangolini was more specific. He, she described elliptical, binary, point symmetric, irregular, stellar. A lot of us are very interested in this topic, what is the cause, the origin of all these diverse morphology. Now, this morphology are two things, okay? First is one-dimensional. We are talking about spherical symmetry first. So these are all roughly spherical symmetric nebulae, and even then they have layers, okay? So when, when can, uh, when can uh, 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 designate the uh, structures, uh, shells, rims, crowns, and halos, depending on the, uh, the density, the, uh, so on. And uh, with the high dynamic range uh, uh, observation, imaging, uh, so the CCD rep 
revolution, one can uh, more or less have the um, descriptive uh, uh, structure uh, based on just the uh, observed images. So definitely, even in one dimension, we have a multi-component structure. So what is the origin of this uh, structure? <coughs> oh, um, okay, so, so they are jumping ahead a little bit. They are also more than one dimensional uh, cases. They are so big. For example, uh, uh, Averro has a uh, role of uh, discovering some of these things. It's multipolar nebula. These are definitely not strictly symmetric. Now, when you try to classify planetary nebulae in terms of different categories, you run into several problems. One is sensitivity. Now, we will show, and it is actually well known now, when you take a deeper exposure, you see a different morphology. So how do you classify it? I mean, you should classify it according to the deepest exposure. It is so depending on species, so depending on which line you are observing or which filter, then you get a different structure. And we know that there is a strong projection effect. So we classify based on what we see in the optical, but what we also know that there is neutral component. I mean, there is a lot of molecular component. And uh, so, so how do we uh, take, in, take those into consideration? orientation effects. Now this is uh, demonstrated by many, many papers uh, in the literature, so even the most uh, familiar object like the ring nebula or the helix nebula uh, but turn out to be bipolar nebula. So it was known by John Levin that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the uh, helix nebula is uh, actually uh, inclined to the sky by 37 degrees. Now to illustrate the question of sensitivity, you have uh, uh, I mean, one of the uh, old, I mean, well-known French nebula, NGC 651, or uh, Messier object, then you have this kind of structure, you take a CCD photograph, then you see a bipolar nebula. So definitely a bipolar nebula is very common. So same, same thing here, you have take some deep exposures, you see more and more bipolars. Now, now with infrared observations, there are some objects which are not obvious to be bipolar, so this is a uh, uh, optical photograph, and then when you look at it in the infrared, it obviously has bipolar looks. So this is a bipolar nebula. Okay. So there's more examples of uh, large uh, uh, bipolar structures. So, so if you were based on your classification, based on the optical, uh, in a smaller field of view, then you necessarily get the whole story. More examples, you look at a nebula which used to be just this part, and actually you have a nebula which is much larger and is uh, bipolar in shape. So this is again in the past, they, you, you may only <coughs> see the central part, but actually this is a bipolar nebula. I mean, sometimes uh, bipolar loops can be very extensive. Okay. And uh, now we also look, know from the uh, spectral energy distribution so these are the uh, division lines in the optical, and uh, actually a large amount of energy of uh, planetary nebulae, in particular young planetary nebulae, are coming out in the infrared. So this is one micron, this is 10 micron. So a lot of the mass of uh, planetary nebula system are in the neutral component. Now, if you look at, take a picture of an optical image, and although you can't see the neutral material, you can more or less feel it. Okay, so this is uh, NGC 6532, 6302, and you can see that it has a very tight waist, so this waist must be confined by some external medium. Okay, and the same is for uh, uh, NGC 2436. So, so you have a waist which you can look at the boundary, it's uh, clearly confined by something uh, similarly here. So now, well now we can go to do some infrared imaging, so you can see that uh, the uh, 6302, the optical image, has a different shape from the infrared image. Infrared are mostly concentrated in this part, mainly the torus. And uh, so, so 
sometimes the nebula are very well confined, I mean uh, optical nebula, and then that means that there must be a cold, cold dust uh, in, in here, which we are not seeing confining the, the media. So, so that in the infrared, they uh, sometimes can also trace the uh, bipolar. Now, there are not many uh, good examples. I mean, the, this uh, is probably one of the best observed by Spitzer. So depending on the wavelength, in the shorter wavelength in the infrared, you see the chorus. You go to uh, longer and longer wavelengths, uh, 24 microns and 60 microns, you see an increasingly spherical uh, component which uh, correspond to the remnant of the, uh, <coughs> of the HP envelope. So somehow we have a shipping process that uh, creates the bipolar loop, so NEC 3346, uh, that uh, that are probably due to some kind of a collimated uh, uh, set of wind that uh, created this uh, bipolar shape, but uh, the whole overall uh, density distribution is actually more or less strictly symmetric. <coughs> yeah, same for polarometry in nebulae. So in the metric infrared imaging, you can see the, uh, the torus, and then the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the fainter part are in the uh, bipolar structure. <coughs> so this is optical image. These are all uh, infrared images from Gemini. <coughs> the same here, infrared showing the torus. Now this is the optical image. The, uh, the, uh, the nebulosity uh, the, uh, in the lobes are all due to scalar get a starlight and the, uh, the, in the infrared that is the, uh, the torus and you can actually uh, see the orienta orientation of the torus relative to the bipolar lobes. So that we are, well, maybe the, uh, the equatorial disc is uh, collimating the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the bipolar flow, but uh, is exactly how is not sure because sometimes they don't line up. The bipolar axis is here, whereas the this direction is there. So one can do some mapping. Uh, so a Spitzer 8 micron map. So this is Hubble 5. You can see there's very tight waist in the middle. And then it seems that the infrared or the massive neutral uh, equatorial disk is uh, there. Or you can do it by molecular lines. Okay, so synthesis observations with CO, you can see the CO outflow, and uh, and you can, uh, well, limited by uh, dynamic range, of course, <coughs> so you mostly detect the uh, torus in molecules, so you can see that there's a lot of mass in there, um, <coughs> that is uh, serves as uh, uh, a mechanism to confine the, <coughs> the ejection along the <coughs> along the polar directions. So uh, these are channel maps of, um, uh, of six, uh, NTC 6302 in CO. So one could uh, try to reconstruct the distribution of the neutral component uh, relative to the ionized gas component. <coughs> so, well, brings up the question. There are many planetary nebulae which are bipolar, including the ring and the uh, ask the helix and so on. Where do they come from? So, well, traditionally, we think that we, when we look at a branch and everything, we look at the optical images. We are always thinking, oh, well, there's where the mass is. But actually, it's not. Okay? So, although branch and are bright because of the recombination lines of hydrogen, Correctionally excited lines of oxygen, sulfur, helium, and so on are very bright, but actually they contain very little mass. Mm -hmm. The mass is only a small fraction of the total mass of planetary nebula. Most of the mass is in the unseen component. So, <coughs> so this contains about well, less than one tenth of the total mass, but they are ten times more I mean, uh, in, the, uh, in the unseen component. So this probably is uh, bound by an unseen torus. Okay. <coughs> Similar here. So what we are 
suggesting is that the bipolar loops are not the result of a bipolar infection, but they, that they don't represent mass being ejected in those directions, but they represent cavities. So those are the parts which have the lowest density. So you have a circumcellular uh, envelope by some mechanism, some fast wheel or correlated wheel, you sweep clean certain directions, you create a cavity, the cavity allows light to escape, it allows photoionization to be channeled into certain directions, and you have a bright spot, and you have a bright planetary nebula. Now, the next topic is about multipolar nebula, which is a more difficult subject. It was discovered by high dynamic range imaging, I mean, uh, well known to the audience here is uh, Wurdo's uh, discovery of a number of um, <coughs> uh, multipolar nebulae, and uh, <coughs> including uh, NGC 2440, uh, and he was able to show that these are multipolar uh, nebulae, so the, although we, uh, in a uh, short exposure, we see this uh, bipolar nebula, but you take a deeper exposure that is not really that deep, mm -hmm. then you can see the other uh, pairs of loops. Mm -hmm. So, so multipolar nebula may be more common than we thought. And this is a quadrupolar nebula, and it has, I don't have time to talk about it, and not only they have two pairs of bipolar loops, they have all these uh, two-dimensional rings, which are perpendicular to the loops, and these are two-dimensional structures. And um, multipolar nebula is actually very common. This, again, you can see the label of the axis, pairs of uh, bipolar axis. So, uh, so a simple nebula uh, in the past we'd be only looking at the middle but actually has uh, several pairs of bipolar loops. Okay. So how about the statistics? Now of course no one have any agreement on these numbers. I mean uh, Manchado had put the number of 12% of multipolars, Shahai say 20%. But I am sure these are just uh, low limits. Yes, we, are, we have gone nowhere uh, near the, uh, uh, getting the complete picture. Now, either we have to accept <laughs> that every planetary nebula is unique, like Norm Sokka says, <laughs> that you don't need to have any theory, uh, or you, they are different manifestations of the same intrinsic 3D structure. So we're doing a... Now, what are the mechanisms? So there's a lot of different so because they are multipolar, they have, you have some time-dependent and angular-dependent processes. So, I mean, Alberto uh, has this uh, bipolar rotating and the solar jets theory, and they maybe have to be ejected simultaneously or episodically, so it's, uh, it's complicated. Now, we are only doing some simple uh, simulations here, okay? So let's start with a simple model, universal model. We have one model, of three pairs of identical bipolar loops. Okay, that's the common model. And then we try to produce different images based on this single model. So in the column, uh, effect of orientation. So these are this nebula being looked at at different angles. And in the second row, we have different sensitivities. So for example, we cut off the last one third uh, brightness. Then you can see that the apparent morphology just by doing this simple exercise uh, can be quite diverse. So you would put a different classification depending on the orientation or the sensitivity that uh, you are seeing. In particular, some features like torus uh, could be due to the overlapping multipolar lobes and they could also give uh, uh, apparent illusions of knots and ensays and so on. So, so there's a 20 planetary nebulae uh, that uh, simulated using a single model, okay, a single model. These are all well-known planetary nebulae, the real objects are in the second row, I mean the, the top row and the, the simulations in the second row. So you can see that a single model can create a lot of different morphologies. So, well, I mean, of course, we haven't solved all the problems, I mean, but we have to look at the, uh, the problem maybe uh, from a more simplistic uh, angle. You say that most of the mass is in the remnant AGB envelope, which got more or less spherical. And somehow, we don't know how, 
there are some holes in GP column in the far south four holes that creates cavities. Okay. And uh, in, at, in the polar branch nebula stage, then we, are, we don't have any photoionization, so the nebulosity are due to uh, scattering, so the starlight uh, escapes from the uh, lower density cavities, and they form these uh, refraction nebulae, which appear to be bipolar. So in the planetary nebula stage, then the UV photons are escaping, and then they are easier, they are more, uh, they are less confined in the lower density regions, that means in the loops, so they photoionize the loops, they illuminate the loops, and they keep apparent appearance uh, of a photo of a photoplanetary nebula. The mass is not in there, okay, most of the mass are not in the bright mm -hmm. regions. So, so optical morphology of planetary Nebula is not defined by regions of matter ejection, but defined by illumination. So those are the, we are seeing the cavities and the holes, which are low, at low enough density where the UV photon can penetrate, and therefore they can illuminate. So what we are seeing are just illumination effects, and not the ejection effects. Okay, well, all the French nebula, these are all scatter lights. <coughs> Now, I think the answer has to come from multi-wavelength observations. So we know that uh, a lot of the energy are coming out in the, uh, uh, in the, in the dust components, and also we have uh, ability now to map uh, with high angular resolution millimeter and some millimeter uh, waves. So we ha hope that by mapping the infrared uh, distribution, hopefully at longer and longer wavelengths, higher and higher resolution that we are able to compare the structure of the dust component to that of the ionized component and also by aperture sensor uh, using techniques like ALMA for example we could map out the molecular structure compared to the optical structure. <coughs> oh wow, a lot of people say in the country that there are bright optics it's not worth studying the bright optics, a lot of advantages. We cannot do many of the things I'm talking about for faint optics. So, I mean, only for bright optics. I mean, if for, for molecular mapping, I mean, right, I mean, only planetary nebulae are bright enough to, to map with any degree of uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, that, uh, say, for example, Elma can do. Optic or galaxy is a set of field contours, is uh, good, not going to tell us anything. <coughs> but uh, well, a lot of astronomers are still hanging on ideas of Aristotle. The universe is simple. Mm -hmm. okay. But we are unfortunately face the reality of a French nebula, which is very complex and dirty. Now, I have not, I'm going to talk about the dirtiness tomorrow, but, uh, but these are. A, a complex. I mean, complex, then you need to be bright <laughs> to be able to decipher what this uh, complexity in, uh, means. Okay? So we have uh, just some conclusions from the morphological components. Uh, so we have uh, multipolar and bipolar structure, and now we have high and high dynamic range uh, uh, pictures. We're able to detect them in increasing numbers. Uh, by, no, by no means we have exhausted not the discovery, and uh, we can also discover bipolars by wide field infrared imaging, and the, uh, the 3D structures can only be uh, determined by proper uh, modeling, for example, by what uh, uh, Wolfgang Steven do by, uh, by shape, and then we have to determine the structure of the dust component, the torus, the lobes, and the halo infrared mapping, and we have to take into account uh, not only the visible components, but also the neutral components. So although we are all biased by the optical images, but they are not a map of mass distribution, and that's for sure. They are actually, they are maps of non-mass distribution because they are maps of cavities of low density. It's so <laughs> Well, I mean, in the last 200 years, our understanding of French and everything has undergone a lot of changes. So, and uh, it began with just uh, a, a, a group.
group of uh, nebulous objects, and then in the early 20th century it was uh, uh, useful because he was used as a diagnostic of atomic physics. So a lot of the uh, <coughs> uh, atomic lines of atomic theory were able to apply to the nebula conditions because of the uh, absolution of planetary nebulae. Uh, although Slavsky was uh, outlined the general evolution, but actually the uh, definite uh, details of quantitative evolution only known in the 1970s. And that was applied to many other fields from uh, AGM to roof uh, weight nebula, young center objects and so on. And uh, by uh, the HSD has done a lot of good because they have a very high dynamic range. And uh, we have thousands of atomic lines, uh, hundreds of molecular lines and mm -hmm. a large number of unidentified ballistic features, which I'll talk about tomorrow. <coughs> so we believe they are now um, <coughs> factories of uh, complex mechanics, and uh, we can still use the atomic lines to trace the, uh, the steps of uh, nuclear synthesis, because many of the, uh, uh, say for example, the slow, uh, slow process, neutron capture, they happen on the AGB, can use the, uh, uh, the, the, the elemental distributions to trace the chemical evolution of galaxies, also the star formation history, and now you can use planetary nebulae to trace the uh, distribution of dark matter uh, the, uh, in, the, in the crustal regions, the bionic mass, and I will talk a little bit about it on the problem of origin of life because of the organics problem. They are, well, in spite of 200 years, I think there are still lots of things that can be done. We did high angular resolution mapping of the ionized molecular and dust components. And certainly, uh, this two part has not yet been done. And uh, we need the uh, better time sequence of the uh, uh, organic synthesis, which I will talk about more, and, uh, and a number of mechanisms uh, for the changing stellar winds, both in time and directions are not yet understood theoretically. So <laughs> to be to stay active, I think we have to be shown that uh, this is relevant as a tool and a laboratory and we can be used to help uh, the advances in other fields. We have to be able to make use of new facilities, large optical, infrared, and millimeter telescopes. Uh, we have to keep convincing ourselves that not everything has been solved and, um, and there are intrinsic merits to try to understand these unsolved problems. We have to remember that after 200 years actually our so-called modern understanding did not happen uh, until 1970. So, so it shows that certainly paradigm shift can happen. Maybe another paradigm shift will happen in the future. Uh, we don't know. And, uh, we certainly do not have the whole answer. Point. But to uh, answer Alberto's question, if you want to challenge this paradigm, you better produce a self consistent alternative explaining morphology, abundance, kinematics, statistics, and so on, which the current challengers are not been able to do uh, anywhere close to, to what uh, so called. I probably should explain this last, I probably should explain this last, I probably should explain this last.